Hi everybody, Chip Brogdon here. I wanted to shoot a quick little video just to say hello and that we love you and that we're praying for you. As I'm recording this, uh, many people in our community and not just in my country, but in many countries around the world are going through some pretty tremendous things right now. A lot of you are in lockdown. You're not even supposed to leave your house. And uh, for us and for others in my community, uh, businesses are closed and we're not supposed to go out unless it's to get groceries or to go to the doctor or some important thing. Uh, time will tell if, if all of these restrictions are useful, if they're helpful, uh, if they are appropriate. I have no idea because I don't know how long this uh, situation will last. I don't think anyone knows. But I do believe that we will get over it. We'll get past this. It's a season of difficulty for a lot of people. Certainly not the end of the world, not by a long stretch of the imagination is this the end of the world. Um, but nevertheless, there are many people who are uh, sick in need of healing, many people who are even uh, dying, uh, but also many people who are in various states of recovery. So recovery is important. Uh, and I don't think if we focus on how many people get this virus and, and how many people are dying from it, um, if that gets all of the attention and all of the focus, then we're not um, giving due credit to the Lord or to the people who are working on behalf of uh, those that are sick to uh, give credit for all those that have recovered. Many thousands have recovered. Most will not die from this disease. And so th these are things I think we should consider and that we should take into account. Not to minimize uh, at all what's going on, but it, it could be that the um, response to what's going on is disproportionate to the actual uh, problem itself. Time will tell. We'll see how that works out. Regardless, and um, leaving aside everyone's opinion on that, because we all have different opinions, um, it, it, it drives me to pray and to really uh, understand the times and the seasons that we are living in, and to make sure that I am hearing from the Lord and that I am sharing with you and teaching the very highest that I can teach you, that we continue to point people to the Lord and to stand for a Christ-centered faith. I think it's interesting that, and, and I don't think anyone could have imagined this, I, I certainly never imagined it, um, I, I, I envision a time when people would not be able to gather together in the institutional church the way they're used to doing and I thought that that if if and when that ever happened that would be a an opportunity for people to really uh, see where their faith is and see uh, if their faith relies upon having a meeting every week or are they close enough with the Lord that they can survive that and even thrive uh, without those face-to-face -face meetings? Well, that's the way we've been living for years. Uh, but I'm more thinking about people who can't miss a church service. Well, now in many parts of the world, we're not able to, you're not able to gather together into a church service. So it's been interesting to watch people uh, try to figure out how to carry on with their religious activities by moving things online. When for the last 20 years or more, we have been sharing a Christ-centered faith, Christ-centered teaching. We've been doing online Bible studies for years and years. Not because we, we are forbidden to gather together, but because the Lord has called us to come out of the institutional church system. And as I like to say, it, it is about a relationship with Jesus, not a religion about Jesus. Um, so we've been in this place, and I call it the wilderness, but it's to me it's not um, a, a place that would imply barrenness or dryness. Um, 
the wilderness in prophetic scripture um, can represent that, but it can also represent a place of fruitfulness, a place where water springs forth, where fruitfulness comes forth, even in a desert place. Um, so I find the wilderness to be very uh, fruitful and very satisfying because um, my relationship with God doesn't rely upon being able to go to a meeting once or twice or three times a week. It used to. My identity and my ministry used to be based on going to church and preaching three times a week, going to prayer meetings, and um, I'm not minimizing social interaction. I think that's important. Uh, but when we attach spiritual significance to social interaction, and then uh, we begin to criticize and condemn those who don't gather together the way some are gathering together and say, well, if, for example, if you don't go to church, then you must be backslidden or you must have a spirit of rebellion. Um, we, we've been teaching Christ-centered faith and how to walk with God outside of church for a couple of decades. I didn't imagine that there would be a global pandemic that would actually shut down church for a season. I thought that's that was interesting. But the point is we've been here to support people in a Christ-centered faith for lots of reasons that uh, they are not comfortable or not led of the Lord to stay in church. You know, sometimes they're just kicked out. Um, they're they're not they, they find it impossible to continue in the church or in the ministry that they were a part of. That's where we found ourselves in 1999, where even if we wanted to continue, we were not allowed to continue. We were, <laughs> we were excommunicated, uh, to put it mildly. So, uh, but that was based on a revelation of Christ and based on a revelation of the body of Christ that transcended the institutional walls. It transcended the church building. It transcended ministry as we understood it. And now we're in a place of, of liberty and freedom and fruitfulness that um, uh, I wouldn't trade for anything. And our vision is to help people to experience the freedom and joy of a Christ-centered faith that isn't based on, rela uh, on religion, it's based on relationship. Um, so it, it's not so much, and, and I have done this at times, uh, focused on trying to get people to see this, trying to get them to see that it's not about church and maybe even uh, strongly suggesting or recommending that they quit church, that they come out of church and that they join us here in the wilderness. And um, I think, I, I'm not sure that, that that is a message that has really resonated with a lot of people who still find their identity inside of church. But what it really does is it confirms those of you who have already been led of the Lord to separate, to come out from among them. I do believe the church system is, is a Babylon system. I think it's an institution, just like government and politics and education and all the other institutions of this world. I believe that the religious institution is, is another worldly institution. Um, and in the book of Revelation, you find Scripture is saying, Come out of her, my people. Um, come out of Babylon. And it is this spiritual harlot that's represented. And I think that, that, um, that is symbolic and that is prophetic as it relates to the end time compromised, lukewarm church of Revelation chapter 3. Now, having said all of that, uh, I, I do believe God leads us out, but I can't call you out. I can't open your eyes to the truth. Um, so really what we're here to do is to support those of you who have already come to that decision, those of you who have already had that revelation. And how do we do it? We do it with Christ-centered articles, Christ-centered teaching, Christ-centered online Bible studies, and all of these resources to help you, to encourage you, to strengthen you in a Christ-centered faith, and to get beyond this idea that if I don't go to church, then I can't possibly have a relationship with the Lord. 
It's absolutely not the case. There are millions and millions of people who love the Lord, but they can't stand church for a lot of different reasons. You say, well, you've just been hurt by church. Well, yeah, um, that's exactly right. Uh, a lot of people have been hurt by church. And uh, so I think that is an opportunity to ask, why does that happen? And how many times does that have to happen before we realize that church is a, is a man-made construct? It's a man-made thing. It's not the ecclesia that Jesus is building on the foundation of himself. Uh, it's not the spiritual house of living stones. It is a man-made counterfeit. Um, and the, the fruit tells the story. Now, of course, it, you've got... Um, You've got good people in every institution. You've got good people who love the Lord, and uh, they love their church, and they love their pastor. And at, at this point in my life, I'm saying, you know what? If you're happy where you're at, great. I'm more interested in people who are hungry and thirsty for Christ-centered, Spirit-led, and Scripture-based truth. And not just to hear teaching, but to, to live it and to put it into practice. And so that has been... That's been our heart. That's been our desire. Second um, Timothy, chapter two, verse two, is really the foundation for for my life and writings and and teaching and everything that I'm doing and have been doing. And to paraphrase Second Timothy two two, it says, "Teach these things to faithful people who can teach others." That's my that's my paraphrase. Um, I think the actual language says the things that you have received from me commit to faithful men who can teach others also. Um, but I'm not limiting it to men, uh, men, women. I think the key verse, the, the, the key idea there is not uh, the gender, not whether it's male or female. The key idea there is faithful commit these things or teach these things, pass these things on to faithful people. I don't care if you're man, woman, boy or girl, whoever you are, uh, teach these things to faithful people who can teach others. What things is he talking about? Well, my belief and my interpretation of Scripture is that everything Paul talked about was centered on Christ. Christ would have the preeminence. In, in Paul's world, everything began with Christ. It ended with Christ. Uh, he is the Alpha and the Omega. And he gives us such revelation in Ephesians chapter 1. He, he discusses God's purpose and that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he says God will gather together in one, all in Christ, in heaven and earth in him. And then he says in Philippians 2 that God has highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, because Jesus humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Paul says that God has highly exalted him and given him a name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, earth, and under the earth, and every tongue gladly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So uh, that, it's interesting, that word, gladly confess, that's not the way it's translated, but if you do the original Greek study, th that word there means to freely or to gladly, with joy, confess something of your own free will. It doesn't mean uh, a forced confession or just uh, the reluctant admission of people who are defeated, but th this is a vision where... Christ is all in all, and every knee is bowing and every tongue is confessing to the glory of God the Father. Now, I realize that idea frightens some people, and it opens up a lot of discussions around uh, theology and, and what have you. And um, I just... I'm happy to engage with people uh, on, uh, up to a point <laughs> on this, but uh, I just don't think you can limit 
the preeminence of Christ. John 3.30 is the most powerful verse, the most powerful principle in the universe. And it says that he must increase, Jesus must increase, and we must decrease, or I must decrease. It's very personal. He must increase, but I must increase, decrease. As he increases, I am decreased. As I am decreased, he increases. What we've been seeing is that this decrease is not for your destruction, it's for your transformation. As you're perfected in love, with less of you, there's more of Jesus. With less of self, there's more of Christ. So it's the difference between a Christ-centered faith and a self-centered religion. <laughs> um, so we talked about that. We've discussed that. I'm just, I'm just sharing uh, my heart with you so that you understand that I think that's what's so exciting and that's what's so important. We can disagree on, on these specifics. We can disagree on how that plays out, but uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the preeminence of Christ. I think that religion has minimized the good news and turned it into bad news for most people. And I believe that most people would be saved if it were not for the church and if, for, if it were not for the hypocrisy of the religious system. And so I think judgment is coming on the house of God because that's what Scripture says. Judgment must begin in the house of God. And um, we see that playing out in the book of Revelation. So uh, my goal is not to uh, convince people who don't want to be convinced. My goal is to encourage those of you who think that you're crazy or you think that you're all by yourself. And I'm here to tell you, you're not crazy. You're not alone. And this could be and is uh, the most wonderful opportunity in your life to finally learn to walk with God and to walk in spirit and truth and not be bound, not be held back by religiosity, by hypocrisy. If you've been hurt by church, embrace that, accept that and then move on to healing. And by healing, I don't mean get over it so that you can go back to church, but go deeper into Christ. Don't let people, don't let hypocrites, don't let the pastor, the preacher, the prophet, or the pope who did you wrong, whatever the case may be, don't let people distract you or hinder you from a Christ-centered faith. Don't let circumstances, don't let the devil, don't let anyone or anything come between you and the Lord. You know, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us, but we can walk away from it. We can allow other things and other people, we can allow hurt and disappointment to enter in. And this is what Jesus warns about, that the, the sower sows the word and then the cares of this world enter in and choke us, chokes out the word so that it becomes unfruitful. Um, so nothing can separate us from his love, but the, the measure of fruitfulness has a lot to do with your obedience, with uh, trusting and obeying the Lord. Uh, where am I going with all of that? Well, it's just to encourage you. Uh, don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Don't quit, but keep on pressing on. Press on, forget the things that are behind, Paul says. I forget the things that are behind and I press on towards the goal for, towards the mark for the high calling of God in Christ. That's what we are endeav endeavoring to do with uh, the writings and the teachings here. Uh, take what you will. Uh, if it confirms something in your heart, wonderful. Uh, if it challenges you, that's even better. But have an open heart, have an open mind. And uh, if it's not for you, then that's fine as well. Because God uh, alone can give revelation. If you had come to me 25, 30 years ago and, and told me uh, that I would not be pastoring a church and that I would not be attending church and that I would not be in the ministry as I understood it then, uh, I would have said you are out of your mind. I would have said that you are crazy. Uh, but uh, the Lord has a way of leading and guiding us uh, in, in a way that 
uh, people really can't uh, add to or take away from. So I want to encourage you to hear him, do what he says, and just know that you're not alone. Understand that God is doing tremendous things in people uh, all over the world, and he's moving and working in them outside of the church system. Uh, I'm not interested in reviving the church system. I'm not praying for a revival um, because I don't, I don't believe that God would revive something that he never endorsed. I don't believe that God would send revival and pour out his spirit on something that uh, is the greatest distraction from the simplicity of Christ that I know of. Um, I think the revival is not going to be in restoring or reforming the institutional church. I think revival is when we begin to follow Jesus in simplicity and in truth, when we realize that God's purpose and goal for us is to be perfected in love, and that God, God's love and His grace and His mercy, His, His grace abounds much more than sin abounds. His mercy endures forever. Love never fails. And uh, it's not people in the church that I'm concerned about. It's uh, people out in the world who are, who are lost, who are confused, who are uh, like sheep without a shepherd. And rather than, uh, rather than calling down judgment on those that are lost, and those that had no shepherd, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the multitudes because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest. I'm telling you, the harvest is all around, and it's, it's not in church. It's not trying to build your church, make your church bigger and better. It's in being real with people, loving them where they are, as they are, and uh, loving your neighbor. You know, you, you might not, don't, don't imagine that the only way you can change the world is to have some big worldwide ministry or some big platform, or uh, the, the only way that you can make a difference in the world is by having uh, a, a big ministry or a big presence uh, that uh, everyone, thousands of people can, can uh, see and appreciate. Loving your neighbor begins with right where you are, uh, the, the people that are closest to you, those in your family, and then uh, your physical neighbors or the people in your community, people you live with, people you work with. And maybe now that uh, in many places in the world, at least for the time being, we're not able to uh, gather together. We're not able to commune with others or to interact with others face to face. Um, maybe we'll have a better appreciation of the value of community and of social interaction. The internet is great uh, as far as uh, communication is concerned. It, it brings people together. It allows us to interact and to engage with people that we'll never meet face to face. Um, uh, and so for that, I think it's wonderful, and uh, we certainly want to take advantage of it as much as we can. But um, that will never replace face-to-face. -face. Um, that will never replace touching one another. Um, so ju just keep that in perspective and uh, use the tools that God has given you. That's what we're trying to do. That's why I'm doing this video. Because with, with writing, you, you somewhat sense my heart. With teaching, it's a little bit easier because you can at least hear me. Uh, video is the next best thing to being there in person. You still don't have the benefit of my presence and I don't have the benefit of your presence. And this is, frankly, one way. This is me speaking to you. It's not me seeing your reaction or, or getting anything um, in return in terms of body language. Um, all the subtle things that make face-to-face -face communication so, uh, so interesting. We don't have that, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, 
at, at least with this form of communication, that you can hear my heart coming through. You can hear uh, and see my my intention. And um, I just want to reinforce our commitment to supporting you in your walk with God, to continue to speak the truth. We'll speak it in love and continue to challenge you not to be content, not to settle, not to get into a boring routine and not just to, to listen to teachings and listen to teachings and never put anything into practice. Um, so if you're if you'll just be led of the Lord in those things and if you will seek the Lord and talk with him and ask him how to apply the things that that you're learning teaching is great Christ-centered teaching is great and that's what we want to provide but a Christ-centered education is even more important and I can't educate you I can teach but I can't educate the education is when you take that teaching and you apply it and you put it into practice and you make it a part of your life um, in very practical ways in the book of Acts and in the epistles all, the book of Acts it unfolds as they lived their lives and they went into different places and they encountered these difficult circumstances you know shipwrecks and and people trying to stone them and um, all kinds of things were going on and that those difficulties drove them to the Lord and drove them to prayer when the Sanhedrin threatened them and said that they should speak no more in the name of Jesus and Peter and John it says were filled with the Holy Spirit and they said you judge for yourselves whether or not we should obey you or obey God as for us we can't help but speak the things that we have seen and heard. And they went and they prayed. And all the people prayed together. And, and I'm saying those difficult circumstances drove them to the Lord. So how can we use that? How can we take these difficult circumstances, these seasons, of affliction and difficulty. How can we take that and use that in a way that we can thrive in the midst of difficulty, not just survive, but to thrive and to be fruitful? And um, I, I just, I trust in the Lord and I believe in the Lord's purpose for you in this time, for such a time as this. In weakness, in sickness for some of you, uh, in social, social isolation and loneliness for many of you. Um, let this be a time where you draw near to God, where you get serious with the Lord, you press into Him in prayer, you get into the Word of God, and you join us whenever you can for these online Bible studies that we're doing where we pray and we get into the Word of God together. Because, uh, honestly, what I'm doing is I believe that I am training this generation, but possibly the next generation as well, to be overcomers, to equip them for battle and to equip them to walk in victory in the last days, in the end times. Um, now more than ever, uh, the, the times that we're living in, great opportunity, but also great peril. And uh, that's exactly what Jesus says, is exactly what uh, Paul warns, the Spirit speaks expressly, that in the latter days, perilous times will come. Some will depart from the faith. What faith? The Christ-centered faith. It's a church-centered faith that is preeminent in the religious system today. So uh, we see these things being fulfilled. Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, ever learning but never coming to the full knowledge or the experiential knowledge of the truth. Uh, so uh, don't be led astray by those things. Don't allow anyone or anything to rob you of your joy. 
and to rob you of the simplicity of Christ. In my experience, everything that's coming against you is coming against you to lead you astray from the simplicity of Christ. We just make stuff too complicated. We make it so difficult. We make it harder than it needs to be. And it's really very simple. Wherever you are right now, you can lift up your voice, lift up your heart to God, and you can pray. You don't need anyone to lead you. You don't need anyone to give you words. You certainly don't need a man of God or a woman of God to come and lay hands on you and pray over you. That's great if you can find it. It's not absolutely necessary because you have more than you realize. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And Paul says in Colossians 1 that it pleased the Father. The Father was pleased happy and glad that all of his fullness would dwell bodily in Christ. All the fullness of God dwells in Christ. Now that's amazing, but what's even more amazing is right after that he says, and you are complete in him. Wow go through life thinking that we are lacking, thinking that we don't have, focused on what we don't have, focused on what we think we need. Then we get the thing we think we need and turns out we didn't need it or it didn't satisfy the way we felt with the way we thought that it would. And from a from a natural perspective, of course, we've got to eat, we've got to pay our bills, I understand that, but I'm talking about you have no idea the fullness and the the completeness that is available to you in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you live in Him, He will live in you. And every spiritual blessing is yours. So why aren't we walking in it? Because it's so vast and it's so great that it's going to take the rest of this age, and then the age and the ages to come to really tap into the greatness and the depth and the height. Again, keeping it simple, not to make it too complex, but to keep it simple, it just means love God and love your neighbor. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you are governed by love and led by the Holy Spirit and all the fullness of God dwells in Christ and therefore you are complete in Christ, I promise you He's going to show you what to do. He's going to give you the words to say. He's going to give you the wisdom and the understanding and the guidance and the direction in every area of your life. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be stressed out. You don't have to be fearful. Uh, be full of faith and fear not. Immerse yourself in this Word of God. Immerse yourself in the Gospels so that you can every day see the love and mercy and grace of God revealed in Christ and just realize the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And if the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He will give life to your mortal body. And that life will overflow, that river of life flowing from within. Now I'm saying all of that is already yours. You don't need me to pray over you. You don't need to go to somebody's meeting. You don't need to get a, a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or a prophetic word. If the Holy Spirit is moving, that's great. Uh, but if it's, if it's just man trying to build up man, we've had enough of that. Let's just get back to the simplicity of Christ, sitting at His feet, hearing His Word. Um, and wherever you are in your walk right now, I invite you, just as Jesus invited the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2, he says, uh, I, I know your works and your faith and all those, those things that you're doing. You're zealous. Uh, but I have somewhat against you. You have 
lost your first love. And he made it very simple for them. He said, remember, repent, and return. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and return. Do the first works again. Return back to your first love. Uh, now's a great time to do that. If you haven't done that in a while, think about that. And if you have never even experience the, the love of the Lord. Maybe you're just figuring out that you've had a religion your whole life and you don't even know what a relationship is. I encourage you to dig into the, the articles, the books, the teachings that we have available here on the site but, and let those help you. But most importantly, get before the Lord and talk to Him and get into His Word. Take His Word for it. Don't take my word for anything. Take his word for everything. That's probably a great place to, to pause right now and, and just, to, um, just to say thank you for watching. I hope that this uh, rambling uh, sharing from my heart is, um, is beneficial to somebody. I would like to hear from you. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Let me know your thoughts. If you have any questions and um, I look forward to seeing you online, and God bless you. Just know that we're praying for you, we love you, and we trust in the Lord's purpose and will being fulfilled in you in every season. God bless. Take care.